You've probably seen those videos on TikTok where somebody gives money to a needy stranger and it all seems all warm and fuzzy. But is that person actually being helped? Did they even consent to being filmed? This week, we're discussing whether kindness influencers are actually good for society. But before all that, I'm getting into the latest Truth Social News, a rentable party robot, that Andrew Huberman expose, and more. That's all coming up next on Power User. Hi, welcome to Power User. I'm here with my showrunner, Zach Mack, and we're going to run through some of the news of the week. Hey. <laughs> all right, let's do it. Go for it. First up, we're talking about Truth Social. Trump's social media company Truth Social went public and almost immediately the stock surged, making it a $9.8 billion company, despite the fact that the company only earned about $3 million in revenue last year. My colleague Drew Harwell has been doing some of the best reporting on all of this. On paper, it seems like Trump is a lot wealthier right now, but he can't actually sell his shares immediately because of a lockup agreement, and it's not clear how much hype this stock will have long term. A lot of people online right now are calling it a meme stock, they're buying it for fun, or to curry influence with somebody who might be a future president. And Trump has a long record of soliciting foreign investment to his businesses. In January, the House Oversight Committee found that Trump had accepted millions of dollars in funding from foreign governments and officials during his presidency. On one Reddit investing forum, one poster wrote that, quote, anyone betting against Trump's companies doesn't understand how many actors in the U.S. and around the world have an interest in giving money to Donald Trump. I think what's interesting is that there's so much concern right now about foreign influence over apps like TikTok, and yet there's not as much scrutiny around Truth Social. And I think that a lot of foreign investment in this company from the wrong actors could really come back to bite Trump. Yeah, but I guess the thing is, Truth Social isn't very influential, right? Like, I, I would worry about TikTok because people actually use it, and it makes money, and it is influential. I don't think that the app itself is that influential, but I think the point is here is how much influence are these investors having over Trump? And we know that Trump has taken investment and changed his position on certain policies. So I think it begs the question if somebody comes in, swoops in, buys up majority shares of Truth Social, makes Trump billions of dollars, do they have outsized influence on him? 100%. If you live in New York, New Jersey, or the tri-state area, and you're at a wedding, bar mitzvah, sweet 16, there's a non-zero chance that you might encounter this giant LED-covered party robot. The tech reporter Caroline Haskins tweeted about this earlier this week, but it's basically this rising trend at parties in the tri-state area where people hire this giant animatronic-looking robot. It's actually a person on stilts, so it's not truly roboticized yet to basically get the party started, blast off fog cannons, play music. You can even pay $200 to get the footage from the robot's point of view of the party. I just love this so much because I want to have a party robot at all of my parties. And I can't wait for the day when these robots are actual robots and not just human beings in robot suits. I think this is a great use case for humanoid robots. Like I want that Boston Dynamics robot at my next party. I was looking over the prices and, and what, the, what they offer. And one, it's pretty expensive. I was surprised. It costs more if you want them on stilts, by the way. And uh, it was saying some of the favorite songs to dance to were like songs by LMFAO, Pitbull, Flo Rida. It's sort of like, tell me you're from New Jersey without telling me you're from New Jersey. Yeah, the robot is $1,000 an hour. I think if you're rich, it's worth it. <laughs> okay, Zach, we have to talk about New York Magazine's cover story this week because it's going super viral and it's all about one of the most famous wellness influencers and podcasters, Andrew Huberman. Andrew Huberman runs this podcast, Huberman Lab, that's really skyrocketed in the past few years to become one of the most popular like lifestyle science-based kind of podcasts. He gives advice about you know, optimizing pretty much every area of your life, getting lots of sleep. It's a lot of sort of basic advice, but he gives sort of science-based answers. And this article was fundamentally a piece about his relationships with women, taking a bigger look at his life since becoming really famous. It also scrutinizes some of the supplements that he sells on his show, but it's really fundamentally a critique of his relationships with women. It was revealed he was dating multiple women at once. Um, he was cheating on people. He was lying to these people and kind of manipulating these women in really horrible ways, um, according to their account. Um, the reaction to this has been kind of all over the place. A lot of people are like, look, this is his personal life. You know, we shouldn't scrutinize it. I think a lot of other people make the very fair point that this man is an influencer. And not only is he an influencer, he is a wellness and lifestyle influencer who has built his entire platform on optimizing every part of your life and essentially controlling every aspect of your life. So in that sense, if he's conducting all of these affairs and being quite dubious in his personal life, 
that seems relevant. So I do think his behavior matters. And I think that this story was worth reporting. But it is being framed as a hit piece by his followers. You had other big people like Lex Friedman come out in support of him saying it's so sad, you know, what they're doing to Andrew Huberman. They're trying to cancel him, da 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 I don't think that's quite fair. I think this is an enormously wealthy, powerful wellness influencer. And the behavior that's described in the story is pretty disturbing. So you and I talked about this on the phone yesterday, long before we decided we were going to cover it. I don't know that we completely agree on this story. I'm not a fan of the show, but I have heard the Huberman Lab probably a dozen times, right? And so I'm familiar with his shtick. It's basically him talking about the, the best ways to optimize your brain and body, right? And so I felt life. like, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I feel like this, this story felt a little bit out of bounds because he's not necessarily preaching morals or ethics on his show. He's really just talking about the best way to optimize your body. And so I feel like his personal life has kind of nothing to do with with his work. But his personal life is sort of directly related to his work, especially when he's talked about things like how to control addiction, how to control your impulses, sure. you know, how to lead this hyper-optimized life. He seems like a very broken man. He's sort of juggling all of these women at once and lying to them and having these really deep kind of emotional affairs. And that to me just, it did call into question, in my opinion, his judgment. And I do question, you know, whether he's practicing what he preaches. If you read this story, the, the takeaway is he's clearly a shitty dude, right? He's clearly like a liar and a cheater and not a great guy to women, right? Like that part is just pretty indisputable. I guess I don't see the connection with, with what his podcast is and sort of what he's pushing because, I, yeah, in the handful of times, do, in the dozen times I've listened to it, it just really is not about – ethics or morality. When you are a lifestyle influencer and you are meeting these women, by the way, directly through his job, through his sure. fame, meeting them on Instagram, it's relevant. You're a lifestyle influencer. So your lifestyle is relevant, right? I think what's described in the article is really scary and toxic and abusive. I mean, he allegedly affected at least one woman with an STD. He didn't give these women informed consent when he was yeah sleeping with them like that's very toxic behavior i don't think this negates his great episode on sleep or some of this other stuff but i do think it's like it's worth sort of like taking this behavior into account and especially i think we we as a society don't take abusive behavior towards women seriously and um we should i mean if he was exhibiting abusive behavior in the workplace it would be a problem if he was exhibiting it in his personal life it should you know it reflects on his character I think it's not okay. But that being said, I think if this exact same article came out and you just swapped his name out for like Drake or Leonardo DiCaprio or any NBA player, I just don't think any of us would bat an eye or be or care, right? Yeah, nobody would care. And I think that's because they don't expect that. And maybe this article doesn't like make it clear enough, but he's really become this larger than life figure that young people, especially young men, like really aspire to, really look up to him. And that is sort of the curse of being a lifestyle influencer, right? You're right in the sense that he doesn't bring his personal life really as much into the podcast. It's not the core focus of the podcast by any yeah. means. But this is a guy who talks all the time about optimizing your life, like scrambling to juggle like four different women on the same day. It's just like a lot of people were saying, you know, it is a testament to his productivity, the amount of affairs that he was able to maintain. Incredible scheduling from on his part. This I would almost put more in the like Tiger Woods camp where it's like Tiger Woods, mm -hmm. incredible golfer, got caught cheating and just had a really messy personal life. The messy personal life doesn't exactly intersect with the golf, right? It doesn't make him a worse golfer that he's like not a great dude. And that's sort of how I think of um, this Andrew Huberman story. It's like, just because he's a good neuroscientist doesn't mean he's a good dude. And like, I, I, I see those things as like fairly separate. Yeah. And I think that goes back to like, do, how do you view him? Do you view him like an athlete where it's like, look, I can appreciate this guy. I can enjoy his podcast and take away what I can. Whereas, you right. know, and maybe not, and sort of like not really listen to him when he starts talking about, you know, maybe personal stuff or things like addiction. Cause clearly I think he has some sort of love addiction or sex addiction or something. Or have you, 
idolized him? And does this shatter your perception of him? And does that question, you know, does his fandom begin to question him? These are the tricky dynamics that content creators, is, but specifically lifestyle influencers and health and wellness influencers have to navigate. I think it's going to be really, really interesting to see how he responds to this, because I think he can go two ways. He can double down and do the like, right wing i've being canceled by the woke media and yeah. there's a lot of men's rights guys that are like rooting for him that are like he did nothing wrong these women are liars they're sluts you know da 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 or i think he could take the accountability route and just say like look fall on his sword of course apologize the internet's not going to ever accept an apology but you just have to you know yeah try to make amends and you try to improve yourself and i just one is a much more lucrative route which is playing the canceled influencer card or option three not say anything and just keep it moving that's another response which is sort of just doubling down i i agree i feel like he's going to be asked to address this at some point it's interesting that the the role that social media played and that like these women, I mean, so many times in the story, they talk about finding other women because the woman was viewing their Instagram stories or liking all of their posts. And mm. I think we're all living in a more connected world than ever. So much of it reminded me of that big Facebook group in New York. Are we dating the same guy? I think there's local versions of it in every city where people post about guys that they're dating saying, Hey, is anyone else dating this guy? Do you know anything about him? Have you been on a date with him? You know, we're all sort of crowdsourcing our reputations more and more now and um so yeah i just it's 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 harder and harder to get away with the sort of manipulation that he would and cheating that he was doing totally i from what i saw on twitter that this story almost feels it feels very split along gender lines unfortunately mm -hmm. Again, I'm very interested to see how he handles it. But I agree with you. There's been a really heavy split online. And I think it's interesting, too, the immediate backlash to the media. Like, how many people just didn't read the story and saw Lex Friedman's tweet? If you look at the replies to Lex Friedman, they all say, first of all, a lot of them are yelling at the New Yorker <laughs> because they can't tell the difference between New York Magazine and the New Yorker, Love which does not it. say bode well for media literacy. Yeah. But they're not reading the article. They're consuming the story through the lens of another influencer's point of view about it. And I think that is the fundamental problem with the media right now. It's that nobody's even really reading and engaging with the story. Instead, they're sort of like, oh, let's see what the, oh, let me read a few tweets about the story. Let me see what my favorite guy has to say about the story. Oh, he says it's bullshit. It's a hit piece. Yeah. I mean, what do you say to that? To, like that, that this piece is a hit job. Well, first of all, critical reporting, the notion, like I, I hate, as a journalist, I hate the concept of like hit pieces or whatever. I will say as somebody that's been on the other side of critical media coverage, that is wildly inaccurate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it is frustrating. I am probably way more sympathetic than I was even a few years ago to people that get negative press because I can empathize. I can empathize with seeing this version of you that's filtered through the lens of a journalist that is, you're like, that's not me. Or like, I didn't say that, or that's not an accurate portrayal, right? This is very much the women's side of the story. Right. Um, Huberman doesn't respond. This is the women's side. And I think it's, look, it's interesting to hear these women's stories and hear their side. And I, I, choose to believe that they're probably telling the truth because women generally do not all coordinate to lie about these things. Um, that said, I do think that there's something about it being a New York Magazine cover story that almost negates its impact. Um, because I think, I think had this been a Twitter thread or had these women come out on Instagram, for instance, I think it would have gotten a much different reception. I think people actually would have been much more like, like likely to believe them. I think now because it's coming from the quote mainstream media, it yeah. can be framed as this hit piece and like, look at this powerful media people that don't like the new media guy. And so they're trying to take them down. You know, like right. there's that narrative in content creator world. New York Magazine is on a roll, by the way, because <laughs> this is like the 10th story they've published in the past month that people can't stop talking about. Yeah colleagues okay well speaking of bulky bros who have podcasts spotify released some new metrics recently and it revealed just how popular joe rogan's podcast is on the platform rogan has over 14 million followers on spotify alone we should say followers doesn't mean listeners it just means people that click to follow his page and get updates every time he posts the next most followed show below him is ted talks at 5 million so it just shows the disparity between him and his closest competitors it's worth noting too that rogan was exclusive on spotify for the past 
last few years. So not only is he a huge podcaster generally, but Spotify actually was incentivized to push him and get him more subscribers to make it seem like he is huge on the platform. Most people don't listen to podcasts on Spotify. It's kind of a mix of all these other apps. Spotify has just north of 30% of total podcast listeners. Apple is just under 30%. I personally listen to most podcasts on YouTube, but I think the fact that he has 14 million and is so large and has so many subscribers on the platform shows that this deal that he did with Spotify was hugely worth it. Not just from a monetary standpoint, but because it's amassed him this new subscriber base that he now has direct access to. Imagine if the metrics were hours viewed for Rogan because they're not even counting for the fact that his podcast, like an episode of The Daily is like 25 minutes, right? An episode of Joe Rogan, is three hours. So you you talk about like time spent and Rogan, like it's not even close. No, it's not even close. Yeah. And this is also probably a good time to remind people to follow us on Spotify. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Help us out. We're trying to catch We're Joe trying. Rogan. The journalist A.W. Olheiser wrote a story for Vox about these two feuding YouTubers. One is named Mark Leda. He has a channel called Soft White Underbelly. It focuses on these sort of artistically styled interviews with addicts and unhoused people. And he is engaged in conflict with Tyler Oliveria, who is this sort of Mr. Beast uh, extended universe character. He has this really over-the-top channel where he films poor and vulnerable people and turns that footage into social media content. Basically, both of them are feuding over kind of who helped this poor family in West Virginia more. Tyler accuses Mark of taking money from a GoFundMe. Mark responds very quickly that actually he didn't take any money and he shows the receipts. I think what's interesting is a lot of YouTubers are also competing with each other to mine these stories of trauma or families in need for content on the internet. Just the fact that we have two totally separate YouTubers now feuding and making content about the same exploited family that the tabloids themselves have already covered for months I think says a lot about the state of media. Yeah, and they're they're all just like claiming to help. You know what I'm saying? On that note, we're going to talk to Brad Podry. He's a content creator himself and an expert in this whole kindness genre of content that's taken over the internet. You might have seen these videos on social media. A person is down on their luck and approached by a stranger, a content creator who surprises them with a random act of kindness. Maybe it's a hug, a warm meal. Sometimes it's even a huge wad of cash. We want to give you 500 bucks. What? Are you serious? Because you're having a bad day, man? Guess what? There's a thousand dollars in there for you. I'm serious, man. God knew you were going to be here today and let me right to you, brother. Are you? Sure. Thousand cash. Come over here, man. Love you, bro. Man, I need the cash. We see the subject's emotional reaction and our faith in humanity is restored. Or is it? That vulnerable stranger probably didn't wake up that morning thinking that their tears would be plastered all over the internet. And obviously, behind the camera is a content creator, thirsty for views, and likely making a whole lot more money off that video than what they just gave away. These creators are sometimes called kindness influencers, and my guest, Scumbag Dad, also known as Brad Podry, is an expert on them. He's a musician, and he creates TikTok videos expertly parroting the whole genre. Hi, Brad. Welcome to Power User. Hi, Taylor. Thanks so much for having me on. I do make fun of kindness creators a lot on TikTok. It's basically one of my standard staples. You know what? I've got something for you. Because you were kind, I'm blessing people. Here's a thousand. Wait, where are you going? We're going to go viral for sure. This is amazing kindness footage. Footage? Wait, did you film me and my daughter? So first of all, for people that don't know and I don't know, have been blessed to never see these videos, what is a kindness influencer? Talk about what these look like. I would say that a kindness influencer is someone whose content is almost entirely dependent on perceived acts of kindness towards strangers, whether it be giving a stranger flowers or giving a stranger money for whatever reason. Uh, That's how I define a kindness influencer. They generally have one of three different sad songs playing and then someone either pretending to approach a stranger or actually approaching a stranger with some spontaneous act of kindness, such as giving them a flower asking if they've had a bad day, and if they've had a bad day, rewarding them with a wad of cash, or asking them if they've celebrated their birthday recently, and if they haven't, they all of a sudden throw a little party. This kind of content also comes in another form where the influencer will pretend to have a disability, or pretend to have some sort of problem, and some kind stranger will help them out. Do you have like $2 to get this bread? It's for my son, I left my wallet at home. Oh. 
I'm sorry. There's four. Thank you, sir. And since you guys were kind to me, and I have something for you, Donna. You gotta open this up. Oh my God! 500 bucks. Oh my God! Yeah. I guess let's name some names. What content creators are most emblematic of this genre of content? I would say uh, MD Motivator on TikTok is probably the most egregious. Uh, Jimmy Darts is another one. There's a guy named Bond Gives, who's another one. On sort of the pretend scenario bit, there's a gentleman named Saul Preto, who's done a lot of like viral videos where he pretends to have a disability. Uh, and I find those really stupid off the top of my head those are some of the folks that i've made fun of you yeah. know kind of over and over and over again to try and sort of show the audience that like their content may not be as authentic or as kind as the audience may think yeah what unleashed all of this on the internet where did this begin i think some people blame mr beast but to me it also feels like a very tiktok phenomenon like, where would you sort of pinpoint the beginning of all of this? I would say that the beginning of all this was the seminal Mr. Beast giving out $10,000 video. Yeah. Well, I'm a YouTuber. I mean, you can see the camera. Yeah. And so I'm just, it's a series where I just, you know, be nice and just give people some help. So uh, if you want to take it, it's about $10,000. And that video is unique because his intentions were completely honest. They were completely upfront. He tells the man there's a camera. Like, I, I, there are sort of moral problems with using a random homeless person, right? But in the defense of that Minister of Beast video, there was no deceit. There was no lying to the subject. There was no deception of the audience. So seeing how many hits he could get from that. Even though his intentions were pure, we have people with far less talent and far less creativity sort of bastardizing that idea. And I think with TikTok came the concept of approaching homeless people with hidden cameras. I think that's when it started to go from true stories of kindness and true stories of potential charity to now tricks. If you approach someone in a Walmart with a camera straight up front, they do not want anything to do with you. I, I would challenge so many people to try this. Walk up to someone, say, hey, would you like to be in a TikTok video? No, no, no. Disabled, <laughs> old, homeless, poor people. You ask them straight up front, you want to be in my TikTok? They're going to say no, right? So that's very important to understand. When you introduce the idea of a, a, a hidden cell phone or body camera, when you introduce the idea of deceiving them right up front, you now get something really unique. You can get performances, that are not actually performances. You can get their true reaction to the money. So what TikTok did is it allowed people with limited creativity and limited means to enter the field of kindness content with essentially no investment and utilize poor people as actors who didn't necessarily want to be. I think that's just such a key part because I think part of it is just the lower barrier to entry and people looking for the cheap TikTok engagement. And Correct. like you said, it's so much easier to like create this yes. content for TikTok. And it's very difficult to understand this unless you've actually tried it, to understand how much people hate being on camera. And I've said this on other <laughs> podcasts, like I've been filming with groups, you know, in a public place or a park in a mall and someone not even close to us will be like, hey, you're not getting me, are you? I'm not on camera. I'm like, no, no miss, we're, we're actually shooting the other direction. Like. People don't want it. And you remove their agency by introducing the camera. By introducing the hidden camera, you remove that element of choice. And if that video gets posted and gets, goes viral, and a, a homeless person speaks out against it, says they were exploited, says they don't like how they were portrayed, well, they either get shouted down or completely ignored because they don't have a, a platform. Yes. You know, and yes. and I've seen it happen where they're like, well, screw you. You got a thousand dollars. I would have loved to have a thousand dollars for being in a video. Those folks aren't understanding that that video was was work that they didn't agree to do. Exactly. You know, I've made fun of this concept a hundred thousand times and some of the videos have gone viral. But still, for the fans of this type of content, it's very difficult for us to get it through their head. Anytime there's a sort of critique of this genre, you get these people online saying, you know, well, what is the harm? If a person is desperate and living on the street and, you know, someone, sure, they are filming without their consent, but they get $500 or $1,000, isn't that a win for them? You know, these are desperate, sad people. Can you kind of dismantle that? Yeah, of course. When somebody says this must be a win for them, 
they're not understanding how this can dramatically affect an individual's life. Mm -hmm. They think it's a win-win, but that's because they never see the other side. They never see the person who goes against the influencer, who's embarrassed by it, who never wanted to be a part of that, who experiences a lot of stress and pain. Just because you, sitting in your college dorm, think you'd love to get the $500, it's important to know that they're not targeting you. They're specifically going after a compromised person. Soup kitchens uh, and you know shelters do not allow filming on premises because they want to protect the dignity of the people there. A great example is very recently, I called out an influencer for doing a very stupid giveaway. He, uh, he surprised a woman on the street and she had a, a you know, physical deformity and he just gave her money. Nothing about the woman, not even her name, not about her condition. It was just, look at me, I'm giving money. And I made a call out video and this person got in touch, right? Which is very rare. It's very rare to find these folks because usually they Wait, don't want. So any. you actually, yeah, I, I can't. It's, it's so hard to get in touch it's with so these hard, people. It's so yeah. hard to get in touch with them because the kindness influencers they seek out people with like limited social media knowledge. That's exactly. why they go after compromised populations, yeah. veterans, old people, the homeless. Even if they feel bad about what's happened, what are they going to do? They don't have a TikTok account. Exactly. They, they don't have any way to reach out or sort of hit them back. So anyways, I made this video and the, the subject's friend got in touch and she's like, I know that person. She's a very sweet lady. You want to talk with her? I'm like, I would love to talk with her. And at, I did talk to this person. And at first she was a little bit defensive. She was like, what are you trying to get out of this? And I was like, look, I'm, I'm trying to gain understanding. If you walked away from this situation happy then and I'm wrong, then it's going to affect the way I make fun of kindness people. Like, like I'm, you know, sort of very emotionally invested in this. And what I learned from this person was that everything I thought was right. She did not know she was going to be posted. They did not do any follow-up and she was embarrassed by the situation. But the unfortunate part is that when I asked her, look, can I do a follow-up video sort of proving this? I know you don't want any more attention online. Like I get it. You know, she already was upset that two people had made videos without her consent. One, the first guy who put her there, and then me, the second guy, who was like, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. But she didn't want any more smoke. So I said, could I make another video showing how upset you were? And she said no. And I, that was it. I dropped it. And that's happened multiple times. Because I'm sort of in this, yeah. because I'm in this unique position of being like one of the bigger creators who actively goes against these guys constantly... On the few times that I've actually been in touch with disappointed subjects, they say, you know what, I appreciate you reaching out. I hated it. Whatever, I got money. It wasn't worth it. I wish I walked away, but I don't want any more. Like, I don't want any more attention. And the subtext also of all of these videos is very much like, you should be grateful, right? These people should be so grateful that this TikToker yep. showed up and helped them. Exactly. I feel like so many fans of these kindless influencers have this parasocial bond with the content creator and they almost feel like they're, they're themselves doing kindness by participating in this video. You see a lot right. of these kindness people say like, you know, like and subscribe or follow this video or share this, you know, so that I can do more, so that I can spread more good in the world. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about sort of the way that people kind of view this almost as the, its own form of activism? So a lot of folks don't want to get involved with their communities they're too busy or you know whatever reason but by liking commenting and subscribing to these guys they can say like okay well my contribution helps them because I follow them because I promote this content I can encourage more of this thing into the world that is what they think they're doing but then when I point out people who use it badly they're like well this is an isolated incident they're not isolated incidents. This is happening all the time. It's just not getting any publicity. You know, a good example is when an influencer named Keenan Bank lied about how many tacos he was giving. Can I get a thousand tacos? A thousand tacos. Can I get a thousand egg McMuffins? A thousand egg McMuffins? How much for a thousand buddy burgers? And then people started to notice that he, there's no way he was buying that many. And you know, a couple people called him out. He had to make an apology. Hey guys, so I just want to say that I did not buy a thousand burgers. So I essentially was just trying to add clickbait to those videos. Honestly, I made a mistake and I shouldn't have done it. But the crazy part is that the fans are like, well, at least he's doing something. Another big issue with what these people do is that they don't, and, and I know Mr. Beast has been called out for this as well, but 
these people don't advocate for systemic change. It's so individualistic, I guess. And it, it feels very limiting in that way too. I mean, like Mr. Beast finally, after I think curing a thousand people's blindness or whatever he did was like, yeah, well, you know, like the government or someone should pay for healthcare. Right. And it's like, exactly. Well, in the defense of Mr. Beast, I will say that Mr. Beast never says he's a charity or at least if he's true, uh, he, he, he does have his oh, charity, he, but you're he has right. charity, but his main channel in, in Mr. Beast defense is yes. Mr. Beast's videos are almost always about the ostentatiousness of the giveaway, the amount of money. Yes. To take take yes. your Don't take your hand off this car and you get it. It's almost, and I could be wrong, I haven't seen all of his content, but even in the Thousand People Blindness video, he didn't centrally focus on like one person getting their, their situation cured. It was about him and the ostentatiousness of the giveaway rather than turning it into a pity party for any one specific person. I kind of agree, but he does explore. I mean, people came out afterwards and said, you know, this is kind of frustrating. And I, I think, look, I, I agree with you. Mr. Beast of all of these people is significantly more ethical. Also, just to the point that every single person in his videos are signing a release form. They yep. know what's going on. They're opting in. Yep. And, I, you know, no hate to that. I think it's the trickle down effect like you're talking about Correct. where people are seeing this. And and look, Mr. Beast does not speak out about these systemic. He's not getting involved in political issues. Right. It's all right. about these stunts and things. But I do think people in these local communities, I mean, I'm thinking of some of these people that wait outside the, you know, the shelters or the grocery store, right? Like, they're not working with local organizations on the ground that are actually involved in helping these people on a day-to-day -day basis. Correct. And, and I think the Mr. Beast effect is very interesting to dissect because a lot of these guys will sort of, when backed into a corner, sort of argumentatively, or when their fans are backed into a corner, they'll say, well, Mr. Beast does the same thing. And I reply like, no, Mr. Beast is a game show. Mr. Yes. Beast, you know, you could, you could sort of wax poetic about all of Mr. Beast's moral issues. But at the end of the day, Mr. the Mr. Beast channel is a game show. He does things that have no nothing to do with homeless people on his main channel. You know, I'm going to put money in this box and fire tanks at it. That has nothing to do with giving. Whereas the guys I'm specifically targeting, they are dependent on it. The point of the videos is to just use authentic, poor, and disadvantaged people in videos and then use the money giveaway as a shield. In one of your videos, I think you said that a lot of creators are scared to call this out because they might lose sponsorships or come under fire. Um, why don't you think more other content creators kind of speak out against this genre of content? I personally think most content creators don't speak out against it because they don't want the heat. They understand that this stuff is extremely sponsor friendly, extremely viral. They don't want to seem like they dislike homeless people and their income is more dependent on their social media profiles than mine is. I have another career that is fine. Like if all this stuff fails, like I'll still have like a pretty good lifestyle for my wife and kid and I. So I feel like they're in more sensitive positions. And also, I feel like their experience with this type of thing isn't as vast as mine is. So so like, you know, the random comic, the odds of him or her working with a compromised population at some point in their life are fairly low. Whereas through my dental career, I've gone through school and worked with, you know, low income communities. Uh, even now, I accept uh, mostly Medicaid at my practice. I did volunteering with a low income dental clinic, you know, throughout high school. And so I've had more experience with disadvantaged populations than I think the average TikToker. And at the same time, I've actually, one sort of key moment for me, and I've talked about this before, but I used an authentic homeless person for a piece of content two years ago. This was when I was starting to make fun of these guys, but I wasn't really aware of like all the ethical implications. And my joke was that I, I bought him sandwiches, I gave him like 80 bucks, and uh, I met with him twice and I said, hey, we're going to make fun of these guys. I'm going to hand you food and you're going to hand me a coupon that says this is good for a million likes, which was like a fairly simple joke, not nearly as subversive as what I do now. But I made the video and I was a much smaller TikToker. The video got like 30,000 hits in the first hour. It was going great. And I showed it to him. And to my absolute shock, he got super mad. He was like, this isn't funny. I don't like it. I'm like, I'll take it down. I'll take it down. And I realized something. I realized he didn't care about the money, even though I told him everything we were doing and showed him the results afterwards. That didn't mean he has the obligation to like be thankful for it. He loathed the fact that 
tens of thousands of people already saw him in a compromised state. And that, that broke me. That broke, that was probably the, the moment where I'm like, oh man, how many of these other subjects are offended, taken advantage of? At the end of the day, it's about consent, right? And these people didn't consent to what, you know, being on this, these TikTok channels, often they don't even, you know, realize. And then also it's, as you said, it's this like view of yourself. You know, we all know that like what is on the internet lives forever. And Mm. these are people in compromised situations often. And that's going to live forever. And that's like, you know, I feel like none of us would want, you know, a video of ourselves down on our luck or crying or, you know, like in a position, in a bad position. And I don't know that there's that much money in the world that really makes that worth it because it really messes with your sense of self, right? Yeah. When the veil is lifted and some of these guys have um, sort of let the veil crack a couple of times, but it's, it's rare. Those are the dumber ones. Jimmy Darts, MD Motivators, sort of the bigger guys, they're smart enough to know not to engage with me on any sort of natural level. They, they know they're winning this fight, right? Which is true, which is true. I'm essentially an old man ranting at the clouds. But a couple of them have gotten weird and like made Instagram stories. One of them even challenged me to a boxing match, which is very stupid. Why did everything always ends in boxing on the I internet, don't know. I swear to God. Because it's a legal way to punch someone you don't like. And I, yeah. I find that to be... Uh, very absurd. Um, all right. Well, this has been such a great conversation. Thank you for your kindness in joining us. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, don't forget to go to my GoFundMe link to help yeah. more influencers be kind. <laughs> well, thank you so much again, Brad. I really appreciate it. So yeah, have a great day, Taylor. All right, that's the show. You can watch full episodes on my YouTube channel at Taylor Lorenz. Power User was produced by Travis Larchuk and Jelani Carter. It's mixed and mastered by Brandon McFarland. Our video producer is Brandon Kiefer. Our executive producers are Zach Mack and Nishat Kerwa. Power User is part of the Vox Media Podcast Network. If you like this show, give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode of Power User. See you then.